So I will proceed now to the second talk, which is given by Art McDonald, who doesn't need any introduction. He is the director of the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory Collaboration, and he has in 2015 received a Nobel Prize for the discovery of neutrino oscillations, which showed that neutrinos do have mass. And in his talk is um, actually going to talk about some medical applications from fundamental physics research to medical applications, ventilation system, and PET. So please uh, take the floor. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about is uh, how uh, a group of people that normally are studying the uh, uh, the dark matter. No, mi stava raccontando. Except 85% of the matter in the universe, but has not yet been clearly identified, uh, reprogrammed their activities uh, during 2020 to produce a new inexpensive uh, type of ventilator, particularly targeted towards the most uh, severe uh, COVID-19 patients in uh, ICUs. Uh, my target we were able to uh, Ho visto da qualche parte. Sorry, is there a problem? Um, there's some background noise that is being heard, so please make sure that the microphones are muted. Thank you. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> so we came together with uh, uh, Elemaster in Italy and with uh, uh, companies and national labs in Canada and the US to build this uh, new type of ventilator. The collaboration that uh, reprogrammed themselves uh, is uh, aimed at a experiment to be cited in the next couple of years at the Gran Sasso Underground Laboratory in Italy. You can see the institutions uh, listed on the uh, left side. This came about because uh, in March of 2020, when uh, COVID-19 was uh, being very strongly felt in the Lombardy region and in Milan and Italy, uh, Cristiano Galbiati, who's the leader of our international uh, astroparticle physics experiment for dark matter, uh, was in lockdown. But he recognized that what we're doing in particle physics, in this case, handling uh, both gaseous and liquid forms of argon, uh, has a lot of overlap with what you would need to do to produce a ventilator. So he reached out to the team and uh, there was immediate response. In fact, I personally have been very impressed by the degree to which uh, scientists who normally are pursuing very basic science topics uh, were very pleased to work seven days a week for uh, many months to try to solve something that would perhaps give assistance in the current pandemic. He contacted me in, in Canada and I was able to obtain support from national laboratories across the country. And uh, we uh, <clears throat> took an attitude from the very beginning of this project that this was to be open source. This was to be something that is published openly, uh, that is to be done with an open source license so that uh, the design that we had obtained, which also uses parts that are readily obtained from supply from normal supply systems, uh, could be reproduced in other countries. And so this shows you the authors from, I think the second paper we put forward, first paper was uh, put forward in about, uh, uh, well, this paper was about 10 days after we started the project when we had a prototype working. We uh, uh, proceeded with that and finally published a paper uh, at the end of March of this year, uh, which had all of the details contained within it. This is what the device looks like. By working with experienced uh, manufacturers, we were able to produce a device which is uh, very amenable to uh, use in uh, hospitals and uh, uh, in this pandemic and uh, uh, able to be supplied internationally. Um, it's very simple when you look at what a ventilator is supposed to do. Uh, you basically open a valve uh, put oxygen into someone's lungs and then open an exit valve and allow the elasticity of the lungs 
to exhale, exhale it. Uh, however, uh, what you're dealing with turns out to be much more complicated, particularly as we are not experienced in doing, but help, had great help from medical experts in dealing with uh, patients directly. And uh, so when you do that, you need to have additions to the simple concept. Well, first of all, the simple thing is a controller that uh, controls those valves uh, based on pressures that are measured at the relevant locations uh, on the uh, device and on the patient circuit, so-called tubes connected to the patient. You have to monitor for uh, how the, what the flow is and for leaks. Uh, you have to monitor the oxygen content. You have to make sure that there are safety valves for all possible circumstances as defined by the regulatory agency's uh, testing criteria. We put in a redundant supervisor, a uh, redundant CPU uh, that uh, would cover any circumstances with, <clears throat> which might be a problem with the central CPU. We also had to have alarms, of course, for uh, personnel in the event of any sort of uh, problem. And so we ended up with a device which in the final design is much more complicated than simply the two valves, which represent V1, the entrance valve, and V2, uh, the uh, exit valve. Uh, but we were able to do something with uh, simply controlled and displayed um, circuits that uh, adapted to <clears throat> two particular conditions that you find in a uh, in an intubated patient at the final stages of, uh, of COVID when you want to be uh, providing, in some cases, uh, full control of, uh, of the breathing um, and uh, in other cases, support for the breathing. So the first pressure control uh, ventilation where the patient is normally unable to breathe on their own provides a uh, measure of well, a profile for pressure, uh, which uh, can be adjusted in terms of its timing, in terms of the amount of uh, pressure and oxygen content to be uh, included. Uh, and so normally a new breath would just start at the end of the previous, but if the, pa if the patient does begin to breathe, uh, then on their own, then you need to uh, uh, initiate uh, a, uh, a different response. You need to deal with uh, patients sighing, uh, coughing, uh, and respond to their weak attempts to breathe. Uh, you maintain a certain final pressure <clears throat> so that uh, the avioli do not completely collapse, which improves the uh, oxygenation. If you're doing pressure support or support ventilation, I should say, uh, you, what you need to do is to detect the existing breathing pattern and to support it in the way that it needs to be supported. So this is what the device looks like in terms of what the doctor or the respiratory therapist has access to. And as you can see, it can be adjusted rather readily. Uh, what is being adjusted here is a combination of the uh, uh, pressure, the respiratory rate, and you can see that adjusting the different uh, configurations is, is quite simple. On the right, you see a simulation of the patient's lung, and you can see that as the uh, device is uh, adjusted, then uh, uh, you can uh, control this very well. So uh, that's the final product, but getting there was a rather major activity. It's uh, <clears throat> the evolution equivalent to the sort of evolution in cell phones, in our case, took on the order of six to eight months uh, and uh, uh, improved as we went along. But those devices that we had operating on the bench in 10 days had to be industrialized and all of the safety features I mentioned had to be included. It involved strong advice from medical experts. <clears throat> in this case, we worked very closely with uh, medical experts who were in the midst of the uh, outbreak in Milan, as well as doctors in, uh, in Canada and the United States, uh, to design the device so that it could deal with, well, what you saw on the last uh, 
uh, uh, the video uh, such that it could be very uh, appropriate for patient care. It had to inter interface with the hospital in infrastructure and had to be safe in all considerations where we were following the ISO and other guidelines in order to accomplish that. Working very closely with manufacturers was important. And we were fortunate that Alamaster in Italy and then eventually in Canada, Vexos and JMP Solutions who obtained a Canadian government contract to manufacture thousands of these ventilators for the Canadian stockpile. Uh, they were very closely coupled into our activity and we learned a lot from them in terms of making a robust uh, industrialized device. We really had hundreds of physicists and engineers with experts of expertise in all of the aspects of this software development, software safety, where we were fortunate in having uh, actually Canadian software specialists who normally were dealing with software that had to be safe for nuclear reactors. That's the national laboratory that uh, came to our assistance in Canada. But ex electronics expertise, uh, pr primarily in, in Italy and Canada, instrumentation, project management, where we were assisted by being used to managing these large scale projects with uh, hundreds of, uh, of international people during the last year working over Zoom, but in general working on, uh, on the internet, which of course was originally developed for physicists to collaborate uh, uh, at CERN. And so we learned a lot about quality assurance and quality control and the performance standards we had to meet for the various means of or various authorizations we required and for the final standards association certification, uh, which uh, was appropriate for a mechanical device, mechanical and electronic device. We were very helped by donations uh, where at one point we had to make commitments on uh, supply chain and didn't have the resources as yet to do it. And so uh, really the world has come together uh, to assist in COVID-19 and we benefited from that. So this is the time scale. Initiated the project on March 19th in Italy. Uh, we had devices working uh, very quickly, uh, even the industrialized devices, which were then improved upon. Obtained FDA approval a contract from the Canadian government, uh, approval by the uh, Health Canada Regulatory Agency in Canada, and then eventually by the Canadian Standards Association. Started production in November and had 7,300 developed uh, or delivered, I should say, to the Canadian government by uh, February. Telemaster has proceeded to obtain a CE mark so that this is now certified for uh, distribution in, the, in Europe as well. Current status is we have over 7,300 units produced and accepted there in the Canadian stockpile. It appears as though the stockpile that we have in Can Canada will not be needed for Canadian needs. And so from the very beginning, there was a consideration that donation to other countries was a possibility. And uh, that is being pursued at the present time and we're providing assistance in that process. I'm gonna switch gears completely now and go to yet another project that was recognized by, uh, well, Christian Galbiati among others uh, as a potential advantage of the technological development we had been doing where we are using liquid argon for the detection of dark matter particles in an underground laboratory, these particles, unlike cosmic rays that are shielded by the rock above us, will penetrate through that rock and produce a recoil of a argon nucleus that produces a faint burst of light. And our efforts in, these pro in this project is to both have high efficiency for detecting that light and also have excellent timing capabilities in part to be used for the resolution of where that event occurred within the detector. And of course, high efficiency as well as uh, high uh, timing capability is the sort of thing you need for time of flight positron emission tomography. I have not personally been working on this project, but Cristiano and uh, 
others who have been are on this call and can answer questions on it uh, as we go along. With liquid argon, and particularly liquid argon with xenon uh, uh, introduced at about the 20% level, has timing where the events occur in uh, under five or so nanoseconds, giving you very sharp definition of when the event occurred. The detection efficiency with these uh, silicon monomultipliers operating again in a cryogenic environment with uh, multiple layers of, uh, of them in regions uh, of uh, uh, liquid argon plus xenon uh, detectors within this volume, which has been chosen to be equivalent to the total body uh, type model for a PET scanner. Um, gives you those sorts of advantages that are mentioned at the bottom of the slide here. Timing improved by a factor of four and uh, detection efficiency improved by at least a factor of 20. Uh, some part of that coming from the, the whole body aspect compared to uh, present commercial scanners, but factors of five or more in efficiency uh, independent of that. So the project is going forward based on the patent that you saw listed on the first slide. It's based on this proven technology. There is prototype funding in Italy, simulations going on in the US and Poland of the device that you saw in the first uh, slide. Uh, it is using liquid argon doped with xenon in place of the usual LYSO crystals. The possibility here with that increase in timing and in uh, efficiency is a reduction of fluorine 18 dose and suppression of secondary cancer risk. But it also opens the gates for more frequent screening, screening or shorter screening times in adult patients or for pediatric uh, use where uh, the, the normal doses are higher than is uh, considered typically safe. And it also can use, be used for tracing uh, the drug migration in real time. I'll show you at the end what the increase in sensitivity gives you in terms of uh, increased count rate. So th this is a geometry that is being uh, uh, simulated. We are looking for uh, 500,000 channels, which is similar to a prototype that is being developed at the University of California at Davis called the Explorer, which is a whole body uh, scanner using the OYSO uh, approach. Uh, all of the simulations that we're doing are strictly following the NEMA 2018 international standards and the phantom geometries uh, uh, proposed uh, in that uh, recommendation. And uh, what we find is an improvement, which you can see here in this table, which has a lot of information, but basically the uh, for the simulations that have been done so far, which are not yet uh, enhanced to the ultimate in, uh, in imaging technology uh, or application of AI, for example, but using uh, uh, standard uh, initial imaging, we find that we can get resolution that is very similar to the resolution in two uh, commercial detectors, which are not whole body, but uh, we expect that for whole body, uh, we will have, as you can see here, a factor of four or so larger uh, counts observed in our detector per kilobecquerel of source. Part of that comes with the improved timing, which is, as you can see, about a factor of five better than LYSO. The, uh, uh, final results then uh, are very encouraging and uh, uh, we expect that uh, uh, we will be able to uh, uh, provide the opportunity for a device that can be commercialized that will have significant advantages in terms of the reduction of dose and or the improvement of resolution. So thank you. Thank you very much for that talk. Uh, very quite an achievement with the ventilator. Um, I don't see any questions, but I do have one. Um, looking at your ventilator, 
what would be the main features that differentiate it from whatever else is or was prior commercially available? Well, we did not attempt to uh, uh, support um, all of the elements that a ventilator might be used for, such as uh, neonatal use and, uh, uh, and, and use with masks in general, um, uh, simply because what we wanted is something that was uh, low, low in cost. It has, has on the order of 50 central pieces as opposed to on the order of, well, certainly in excess of a thousand uh, central components in a more sophisticated device. And our objective was one of the things that was called for at the beginning of the uh, epidemic, and that is a device which is uh, uh, able to be supplied rapidly from existing supply chains, and that would be inexpensive, and it's at least a factor of two below uh, any other uh, typical market uh, available ventilator, and uh, uh, substantially low, more than that, below the most sophisticated ventilator. So it was rapid manufacture and targeting of the most severe COVID patients that was our objective. Well, that's a very important consideration. And in the meanwhile, there's uh, two questions that came in. One is from John Pryor um, asking, as compared to the Explorer Total Body Pets, would you expect your system to be in the same price range? May I ask Christian Gabbiati to respond to that, please? Sure, Art, I'll, uh, I'll be happy to take the call. Uh, I think it's certainly uh, more expensive than the Explorer scanner because the geometry of the detector is more complicated inside it and has multiple layers of silicon PMs. Maintenance, I don't think, would be a factor because those are detectors that are built to uh, operate with uh, standard levels of maintenance, but certainly more expensive, uh, even significantly more expensive. Thank you. And uh, the second question was exactly the same from Harry. Uh, so thank you very much.